In this lecture presentation, we'll be exploring the world of hypothesis testing, which is the use of data to inform and or evaluate theories about the nature of the world. As always, I recommend having the slides available so that you can take notes as we progress through the presentation. Hypothesis testing refers to the scientific method of evaluating a set of beliefs about the nature of the world. The goal of hypothesis testing is to validate theories that then allow us as humans to make accurate predictions about ourselves and the world. A hypothesis is really just a set of beliefs about the nature of the world. Often this belief refers to some sort of relationship between two or more variables. Hypothesis testing in research involves evaluating the accuracy of the hypothesis. It's also used in everyday life to help us make sense of the causes of social and physical events. It helps explain people's behaviors and reactions, helps make the world feel more predictable, and helps us feel in control of events and of the future. There are two major ways of approaching the scientific method in psychology and those are through qualitative and quantitative research methodologies, which we'll discuss next. As we discussed previously in the Introduction to Reasoning lecture presentation, there are two primary approaches to research methodology. That includes deductive and inductive methods. Those of you who like to pause the lecture presentation in order to view the videos might pause here to watch the video Qualitative versus Quantitative Research. Deductive and inductive reasoning in many ways are opposites of each other. Whereas deductive methods begin with a hypothesis and then observations are used to test that hypothesis, inductive methods begin with observations that then lead to a hypothesis. Therefore, for deductive research methods, they begin with a hypothesis that is believed to be true and then systematically make observations to test that hypothesis. They collect evidence to confirm or disconfirm their hypothesis. This is the foundation of quantitative research, which often employs statistics to mathematically evaluate the accuracy of various hypotheses. Inductive methods begin with observations. With inductive research methodology, the researcher will observe events and then devise hypotheses based on those observations. Not only is this the foundation of qualitative research methodologies, it's also the primary way we learn about the world. Inductive and deductive research methods actually have a cyclical relationship in that they each inform the other. In some cases, it makes sense to begin with a deductive method, and in other cases, an inductive method may be preferred. Oftentimes, inductive methods are utilized when the hypothesis is poorly understood and or the phenomenon of interest is poorly understood. Deductive methods are a great way of statistically analyzing the accuracy and value of various hypotheses that may have derived from inductive methods. Ultimately, observations change our hypotheses, and hypotheses change what we observe. They each inform the other, and our understanding of various concepts are strengthened by the contribution of both forms of research. A critical component of hypothesis testing is to search for disconfirming evidence, which helps us to prevent falling prey to the confirmation bias a concept we've discussed previously and will continue to discuss throughout the course. In order to properly evaluate research findings, it's important to understand some foundational research terminology. First, the operational definition. An operational definition is a clearly described definition. That is, the criteria for what constitutes the concept you're interested in is clearly presented. This can be quite easy if the variable, for example, was shoe size. However, when the variable is something difficult to define, such as motivation or love or success, it's even more important that the researcher put time and effort into clearly operationalizing their definition 
so that everyone, including the researcher, knows exactly what they are studying. The impact of an argument or of research findings diminish if there's no clear operational definition. For example, if you wanted to study successful women who are paid high salaries, how would you define successful? And what constitutes a high salary? Unclear definitions lead to problems with vagueness and ambiguity, which we discussed in the Thought and Language lecture. The next term is measurement sensitivity. Measurement sensitivity refers to, as it sounds, the sensitivity of the measurement device. The sensitivity of a measurement device is determined by the needs of the research study. For example, if the variable is temperature, you might need a thermometer that is able to detect very small changes in temperature, or perhaps broad changes in temperature might be sufficient. For example, if you wanted to see how well Tylenol works for reducing a fever, you probably would not need an exceptionally sensitive device to measure the change in a fever of, let's say, 103 degrees, going down to maybe 99 degrees. However, if you were using a measurement tool to evaluate temperature changes in response to stress, you would need a highly sensitive tool because it would be very rare for somebody under a stressful condition to have a massive change in temperature. Appropriately sensitive measures are good enough to detect the necessary changes so that you can correctly conclude if the variable you're interested in has changed or not. Speaking of variables, a variable is any measurable characteristic that has two or more values. For example, gender, height, IQ scores, levels of extroversion, or even degree of headache, which I'll use in our example coming up. Variables in terms of research, particularly deductive or quantitative research, are divided into independent and dependent variables. The independent variable is the variable that is under the control of the researcher, that is, the variable that is manipulated as part of the research study. In an example research study that was exploring the use of a pain reliever for a headache, the experimental condition would be the group that is given the pain reliever compared to the group that is not given the pain reliever. That is, the independent variable is whether or not the individual is given the pain reliever or a placebo, such as a sugar pill, which is an inert substance that is used to help reduce the likelihood of self-fulfilling prophecies, a concept we'll discuss later in this presentation. The dependent variable is the outcome measure. That is, what the researcher is measuring to see if there was a change that is dependent on the independent variable. A helpful way to remember what the dependent variable is, is that the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. In our example of a research study exploring the use of pain relievers for headaches, the dependent variable would be the degree of headache relief that the participants experience. Now, if the pain reliever is effective, there should be a significant difference between the degree of relief experienced in the group who are given the pain reliever compared to the degree of relief experienced by the group that were given the sugar pill. When we talk about participants in a research study, we're referring to the sample. The sample is a subset of the wider population. Now, population in terms of research studies basically refer to the group we want to know more about. That is, everyone who meets criteria for the study. For example, if we wanted to do a research study regarding individuals with breast cancer, the population would be everyone who is diagnosed with breast cancer. Of course, it would be very challenging to actually be able to measure every single person who has breast cancer at any given time. Therefore, research studies use a sample, which is a subset of that population. The sample are those individuals with breast cancer who actually participate in the study. Research studies work with samples rather than populations Again, because it's often impossible to get data for every single person or object that we're studying. 
There are many different approaches to sampling, which is the process of gaining a sample. First, we'll discuss simple random sampling. Simple random sampling is analogous to drawing a name from a hat, in that each person in the population has an equal chance of being chosen. It's often a difficult approach to sampling because we don't generally have a complete list of every person in a population. Another approach to sampling is referred to as systematic random sampling. In this approach, the researcher would choose every nth person, that is, whatever number person they want off a list. One approach to doing this would be to number everybody on a list. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and then take all of the fours, for example. Another approach would be to alphabetize, perhaps all students on a roster, and then selecting every 25th student to participate in a survey. Convenient sampling is just like it sounds. These are samples that are convenient. That could be convenient because perhaps there are people walking by, or college students because they need to participate in research to get credit for Psych 101, or rats because, quite frankly, they don't have a lot of choice in the matter. Convenient samples are readily available, but that doesn't make it ideal. One problem with convenient samples is that generalization depends on the variable. For example, if you are studying hearing in young adults, college students are probably pretty generalizable to the wider community of young adults. However, if you wanted to study socioeconomic status and happiness, you would need a wider range of age groups, of socioeconomic statuses, and perhaps of geographic location as well. In cluster random sampling, the researcher divides a population into groups and then uses all of the members of certain groups. These groups are called clusters or blocks. The clusters are randomly selected. For example, if a researcher were interested in course evaluation scores, they might randomly select five classes from each department at a university and look at their course evaluation reports. Stratified random sampling also involves dividing into groups, but these groups are called strata. Rather than being divided around something that's already existing, like in cluster random sampling, when it might be divided based on geography or based on previously existed courses. In stratified random sampling, the groups are divided based on some characteristic. But unlike cluster random sampling, where all parts of a group are sampled, in the case of stratified random sampling, only some of each group are sampled. For example, if you were going to conduct a research study using college students, you might divide your participants into freshmen, sophomore, junior, and seniors. Then, randomly select 25 of each group to participate in the study. Generalizability always depends on the representativeness of a sample to the wider population. A sample is generalizable only if it represents all of the members in the wider population, which is quite challenging to achieve. Representative sample, as you might guess, is the term used to refer to a sample that represents the population of interest. In contrast, bias samples are those that are non-representative and that cannot generalize to the wider population. One prime example of a biased sample is called a SLOP, which stands for a Selective Listener Opinion Poll. An example of a SLOP are quote-unquote research studies that popular magazines conduct. For example, Cosmopolitan Magazine or Men's Health Magazine. When they seek out participants, they advertise in their own publications. That means they are only going to be sampling individuals who are already readers. And, as we hopefully know, readers of particular magazines don't represent the entire community in which they are generalized to represent. For example, a cosmopolitan reader 
is likely to have already engaged in sexual intercourse compared to somebody who does not read Cosmopolitan magazine. So, when they tell young readers about the average number of sexual partners or the average age of losing one's virginity, that is based only on Cosmopolitan readers, not on all individuals of any age group. If they were to present their findings as... 9 out of 10 readers of Cosmopolitan magazine, dot dot dot, that would be fair. However, as you probably know, generally their findings are not presented that way. Instead, they'll say something along the lines of 9 out of 10 young adult women, or 9 out of 10 women. And, as you hopefully know by now, this does not represent all women or all young adult women, and therefore is a prime example of a biased sample. The sample size refers to the number of subjects who are measured or observed in any given sample. It's usually represented by the letter N. For example, in a research study with 100 participants, you might see it noted as N equals 100. The size of the sample influences both the precision of estimates as well as the power of the study to draw conclusions. The measure of error, known as a sampling error, influences the precision of results for any given population. Power refers to the probability of finding a statistically significant result, that is, a statistically significant difference in the dependent variable. The law of large numbers tells us that large samples provide more reliable estimates about population characteristics than smaller samples. Large samples minimize sampling error, so we can be more confident in the accuracy and the generalizability of findings. A priori power analyses are used to determine the sample size that will be necessary to have desirable power, and this is done at the start of a research study. The law of diminishing returns basically states that as we increase sample size, we get closer and closer to the point where it no longer impacts sampling error. Ideally, we want to have a sample size that is sufficient for minimizing or completely avoiding the issue of sampling error. Larger samples increase precision of estimates by reducing error and increasing power. Small samples, unfortunately, underestimate variability which is what makes them so risky to generalize to wider populations. For example, if you were interested in studying the relationship between having orange juice for breakfast and being a fast runner, if you only studied five people, and it happened to be that those five people were fantastic runners and they all drank orange juice for breakfast, you might be tempted to think that orange juice somehow allows people to be better runners, or that People who are better runners like to drink orange juice for breakfast. If that sample instead had a thousand people, you might find that those five were a fluke and that really it's completely meaningless whether you drink orange juice for breakfast or not in terms of your ability to run quickly. Variability is a term that denotes the fact that people, and animals for that matter, differ in the way they respond to experimental stimuli. When it comes to small samples, there's a willingness to believe that results obtained from a few subjects can be generalized to the entire population. Again, with small samples, we must be cautious in our interpretation of findings. Not only does this lead to poor research findings, it also is the origin of prejudice, because the assumption that the actions of a single group member is somehow indicative or representative of the actions of the entire group. A small sample would be okay if everyone in the population was exactly the same, but this is almost never the case. The gold standard approach to quantitative research is the experimental design. When it comes to an experimental design, evidence is collected under controlled conditions that can be openly scrutinized and replicated in the future. The broad stages of an experimental design study begins with creating groups, that is, choosing a sampling approach, and then, once you have participants in the study, randomly assigning them to one of the experimental conditions. 
Random assignment is a hallmark of experimental design. When it comes to creating groups, it's essential that the groups differ on only one dimension, and that dimension must be the independent variable. Otherwise, it's nearly impossible to conclude what to attribute the differences between the groups to. For example, if I wanted to study students in a classroom and I decided to assign them to groups based on the front half of the room and the back half of the room, and then I decide to have the front half of the room be my experimental group, and I meet with them an extra hour a week to discuss critical thinking and to provide additional information about course material. The back half of the group is my placebo group, so we do not meet for extra time. At the end of the course, I decide to use as my dependent variable course grades. And my hypothesis is that the students I meet with for an extra hour a week will outperform the students who do not get the extra hour of instruction. Lo and behold, at the end of the semester, it turns out that my experimental group has significantly higher grades than my other group. What's the problem here? The problem is that I did not randomly assign students to the experimental and placebo groups. By dividing them in half based on where they sat in a classroom, I was not controlling for the variable that existed, which is that students who sit in the front of the classroom oftentimes tend to be students who are more engaged and more motivated to succeed. Of course, that's not to say that students who sit in the back are necessarily poorer students, but it does tend to be the case that the most motivated students do sit in the front. Therefore, it is likely that the front half of the room would have had the higher grades at the end of the semester even if they did not have the hour instruction. That means I cannot reasonably conclude that it was the extra hour of instruction that led to the improved grades. This speaks to why it is so essential that random assignment occur in all experimental designs, in which causation is asserted. In stage two, the researcher applies the experimental treatment, that is, the independent variable. In the study we discussed earlier, this would be whether the individuals were given the pain reliever or the placebo. In stage three, the dependent variable is evaluated or measured to determine if there are differences between the groups. There are three primary types of experimental designs. The first is the independent measures, also known as a between groups design. In this approach, different participants are in each of the experimental conditions. That is, individuals in group A are not in group B, and individuals in group B are not in group A. The pros to this approach is that it avoids order effects. We don't have to worry about individuals getting better over time because of practice, or getting worse over time because of fatigue. The cons are that more people are needed, and therefore this is a more time-consuming approach. It's also more prone to the impact of differences between groups, which are oftentimes referred to as extraneous variables. Things like age, gender, social background, etc. that might not be controlled for in the experimental design. Repeated measures are referred to as within-groups designs. In this approach, the same participants take place in each of the independent variable conditions. So the same people who are in group A are also in group B. The major pros to this approach is that individual differences are reduced and therefore fewer people are needed. The cons is that there is a potential for order effects like practice and fatigue. This can be controlled for with an approach known as counterbalancing which alternates the order of the conditions. Lastly, matched pairs. In a matched pairs design, one member of each matched pair is randomly assigned to one of the IV conditions. So in the study we discussed earlier, there would be matched pairs, one of which assigned to the placebo group and one of which assigned to the pain relieving group. The pros is that it reduces participant variables because they're already matched to be similar. It also avoids order effects, so counterbalancing is not necessary. The cons are that it's time consuming to find closely matched pairs, and it's almost impossible to match them exactly unless they are identical twins who are reared together. 
Before we move to the next slide, I want to give you an example to ponder. Researchers at a university have studied the causes of divorce. They found that 33% of recently divorced couples reported that they had serious disagreements over money during the two-year period that preceded the divorce. The researchers concluded that disagreements over money are a major reason why couples get divorced. They go on to suggest that couples should learn to handle money disagreements as a way of reducing the divorce rate. What if anything is wrong with this line of reasoning? Can you think of any problems? First off, at least from what they're telling us, there's no data from a control group. That is a group that didn't divorce. Maybe 33% of all couples disagree about money. Or maybe it is higher in couples who stay together. Next, there's no reason to believe that disagreements over money caused or even contributed to divorce. Maybe couples in the process of breaking up disagree more about everything. Lastly, as we discussed at length in the memory sections in this course, this type of study is based on retrospective memory. And we know that memory is fallible and constructive and not necessarily a reliable means for evaluating what happened in the past. One of the most popular sayings in the field of research methods is correlation does not equal causation. Let's start with correlation. So correlated variables are any variables that are related. That means they share any relationship. A positive correlation is when both variables rise and or fall together. For example, if the more times a week you go running, the faster you get it running, that would be positively correlated. They rise together in the sense that the higher the number of times that you go running and the faster you run, move in the same direction. It also works in the opposite direction. The less frequently you run, the less quickly you're able to do it. A negative correlation refers to variables that have an inverse relationship. That is, as one variable rises, the other variable falls. For example, you might find that the more often you exercise, the less you experience depression. The more you experience depression, the less often perhaps you are exercising. Those would be negatively correlated. Whereas correlation is relatively easy to find between variables, causation is always difficult to determine. In research studies, as well as in your papers, and just in general life circumstances, it is always to say that variables influence each other or are somehow associated with each other rather than using the term causes. To demonstrate causation takes a very carefully controlled experimental design, and that is not true of most research studies. An illusory correlation refers to any time there is an erroneous belief that two variables are related when they are not. An illusory correlation is simply when an individual believes that two variables are related when in fact they are not. This can maintain stereotypes. For example, blondes are fun, or people who wear glasses are smart. In addition to illusory correlations, Another common error in terms of research interpretations is mistaking correlation for causation. When correlation is used to support causation, it leads people to beliefs, values, attitudes, and decisions that are logically flawed. One example that comes up quite often in the discussion of correlation and causation is the gateway theory of drug use. Many researchers argue that it is not so much that quote-unquote lighter substances like alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana actually lead to quote-unquote heavier drug use, it is likely more accurate to say that individuals who do eventually use these harder drugs like heroin and methamphetamine were likely to start with more readily available and less risky substances. In that case, there is a correlation between people who use substances such as heroin and methamphetamine and their earlier substance use involving 
substances like nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana, rather than having any real evidence that early substance use with nicotine, marijuana, or alcohol actually leads to a higher propensity to use heavier drugs over time. That is, correlation has been mistaken for causation. A lighthearted example of correlation mistaken for causation is presented in the comic in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. As it says here, the researchers have noticed that everyone who went to the moon has eaten chicken before and concluded from there that chicken must make you go to the moon. Of course, we know that the majority of people eat chicken. And of course, in this case, it's quite obvious that eating chicken would not actually make you go to the moon. Therefore, this is a correlation, not causation. In this example, it's quite easy to see that correlation is being mistaken for causation. But in other cases, it can be more subtle and harder to notice. For example, many people attribute children who become delinquents in their teenage years to something simple like bad parenting, because there is a correlation with supposed bad parenting and poor outcomes in teenagers. But it could be much more than that. What if it's due to some kind of behavioral problem in the child? What if it's due to a head injury playing sports? What we know is that there is a correlation between parenting and outcomes. That does not mean that any singular parenting decision is going to be directly causing any outcome in their offspring. If you prefer to pause the lecture recording to view the videos, I recommend pausing here to view the video, How Ice Cream Kills. Two other important concepts in the field of research methods are reliability and validity. In this image, the middle of the target is the true value. That is, the score if the measure were perfectly reliable and perfectly valid. The black dots represent the results from different measurements. Reliability refers to consistency in measurement, or repeatability or dependability. It's essentially the absence of random error. Reliability is presented on a range from zero, completely unreliable, to one, perfectly reliable. For example, if I step on my bathroom scale and it tells me I weigh 120 pounds, and I step off and I step back on and now it says I weigh 150 pounds, that would be an unreliable instrument because there is inconsistency across scores or across measurement. I theoretically should weigh exactly the same as I did moments ago. We'll get back to reliability in just a bit. First, I want to introduce validity, which is the extent to which you are accurately measuring what you are intending to measure. You could think of validity as being meaningfulness, usefulness, or accuracy. It is the absence of bias or of systematic error. Validity is presented on a range from negative one to positive one. Negative one being completely invalid, positive one being perfectly valid. For example, the Beck Depression Inventory is a well-respected measure for evaluating an individual's degree of depression. If someone scores high on this measure, it is interpreted as having high levels of depression. Low levels signify low levels of depression. In order to be valid, a high score on the Beck Depression Inventory needs to correlate well with high levels of depression. If instead it was really measuring someone's anxiety, we would say that is invalid. Now, in terms of the image, you can see that high reliability and high validity is hitting the target consistently every time. In terms of reliability, the scores are clustered close together because the scores are similar each time. In terms of validity, they're near the target. Next, if you move to the right, you'll see low reliability with high validity. The scores are all centered around the target, so the validity is there. But you can see the scores are all over the place, and that represents low reliability. 
Alternatively, if you go down to the next box, you'll see low reliability and low validity. Here, the scores are not centered around the target and they're scattered. Lastly, in the bottom left box, you'll see an example of high reliability with low validity. High reliability in that the scores are closely clustered together, but low validity in that they are clustered away from the center mark. There are many forms of reliability and validity, and they all measure slightly different aspects of those constructs. In terms of reliability, one approach is known as test-retest reliability. Just like it sounds, this is a reliability based on multiple tests over time. This would be akin to the example I gave previously of stepping on the bathroom scale. Each time I take my weight, I am retesting. You might also think of this as an individual who takes the Beck Depression inventory now and an hour later. Theoretically, assuming nothing's changed in that individual's life or mood, their scores should be about the same. Parallel, also known as alternate forms reliability, is consistency across similar measures. So if somebody scores high on the Beck Depression Inventory, they should also score high on other validated measures of depression. Internal consistency is consistency across items. That is, across multiple questions on a measure. In an IQ test, for example, a person should get about the same IQ score if they are looking at questions in the first half and the second half of the test, or all the even numbers and odd numbers. Inter-rater reliability is consistency across observers. This is particularly important in research studies that employ some sort of subjective observation measure. For example, in studies that are looking at different forms of approaches to therapy, somebody has to evaluate how closely the therapists are adhering to the protocol that they're measuring. If the observers do not consistently score the individuals that they're observing, it would lead to unreliable data. Validity, again, refers to meaningfulness, usefulness, and accuracy. There are other forms of validity that are not listed here, such as face validity, that measures the extent to which a measure appears to evaluate the construct of interest. Content validity is the extent to which a measure adequately tests a particular content area. Unlike the other forms of validity that we'll discuss next, this form of validity is judged by experts, and there is no numerical validity coefficient. Construct validity is the extent to which measures evaluate the construct of interest, and it is based on convergent and discriminant validity. So construct validity is essentially how adequately a new test measures a hypothetical construct. It can be calculated by factor analysis or some form of a multi-trait, multi-method matrix. As I stated, it relies on convergent and discriminant validity. Convergent validity is when the criterion correlates with existing established measures of the same construct. Discriminant validity is that we would hope that the scores would not correlate with something that is measuring a conceptually different construct. That is, scores should correlate with other measures that are evaluating the same construct and should differ from measures that are looking at something different. Like convergent structures that were discussed in the argument lecture presentation, when it comes to convergent validity, additional evidence converges onto the same construct and therefore strengthens support for validity. Criterion-related validity refers to how adequately a measure can infer, predict, or estimate some kind of outcome. The term concurrent validity is used if it is evaluating two measures at the same time. Predictive validity is used to refer to when the original measure predicts some future score. For example, potentially how well the SATs would predict an individual's college GPA. Next, let's discuss some errors in hypothesis testing. 
First, I want to mention that those of you who prefer to pause the recording to view the videos might pause here to watch the video Type 1 and Type 2 errors. As you can see in the chart below, there are multiple ways of interpreting information, two of which are true and two of which are inaccurate. Let's start with the upper left hand box. So first we're looking at the relationship between reality and the result or decision or measurement. If in reality somebody is pregnant and the pregnancy test tells them that they are pregnant, that's accurate. Alternatively, if the person is not pregnant and the pregnancy test says that they are not pregnant, that is also accurate. Let's discuss the two types of errors that can occur. Let's say in reality the individual is not pregnant, but the pregnancy test says that they are. This is an example of a type 1 error, which is also known as a false positive. I use the example of a pregnancy test because I believe it is easy to see how this is an example of a false positive. They are falsely being told they are positive for pregnancy when in reality they are not. The opposite of this is a type 2 error, which is referred to as a false negative. In this case, in reality, the individual is pregnant, but they are falsely told they are not pregnant with a false result on the pregnancy test. The relative risk of a type 1 versus type 2 error depends on the situation. In research, a type 1 error is considered to be worse because you have wrongly rejected the null hypothesis, whereas with a type 2 error, no conclusion is inferred because you have accepted the null hypothesis, which is to say that no conclusion can be inferred. However, in many medical terms, type 2 errors are worse because you're telling someone they're okay when in reality they are not. For example, as much as it would be awful to be told that you have HIV when you do not, it would be worse to tell someone that they are HIV negative when they're in fact positive. Not only does this mean that they might spread the disease unknowingly, but it also means that they're delaying treatment. Our criminal justice system is built around the idea that type 2 errors are less problematic than type 1 errors. We have to prove someone is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, not prove that they are innocent beyond a reasonable doubt. This is based on the belief that incorrectly finding someone innocent is less severe of an error than incorrectly finding them guilty. Another concept that is important to take into consideration when evaluating research is the self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling prophecies are also referred to as the Rosenthal effect and the Pygmalion effect. Essentially, the self-fulfilling prophecy refers to our tendency to act in ways that lead us to what we already expect. It underlies the development and maintenance of stereotypes. For example, stereotype threats influence performance, and this has been demonstrated in many research studies. Stereotype threats refer to the impact that negative stereotypes have on performance. That is, how stereotypes can lead to decreased performance. Stereotyping is a cognitive phenomenon, but it becomes prejudice when that stereotype has an effective component. That then leads to discrimination, which is the behavioral manifestation. For example, let's say that you encounter a new person who comes across to you as rude. You then are standoffish around that person because they seem rude and you don't want to be friends with someone who's rude. They see you as very standoffish, so they determine that you're rude. That then leads them to act more rudely towards you, because they don't want to be friends with somebody who's rude and standoffish. Can you see how this self-fulfilling prophecy leads us to exactly what we expect? And from there is used as personal evidence that your stereotype was accurate and that your prejudice and discrimination were warranted. Can you think of what other course concept is at play here? That's right, the confirmation bias. We're looking for evidence that supports our stereotypes rather than seeking out disconfirming information. 
The hallmark study of self-fulfilling prophecies was conducted by Robert Rosenthal in 1964. He sampled students and their teachers at a San Francisco elementary school. He told teachers that some of their students scored exceptionally high on the Harvard test of inflected acquisition, and they should expect amazing things from those students. He followed these kids for two years and found that the kids identified as exceptional really did demonstrate higher gains in IQ scores over that time. The kicker is that these exceptional kids were chosen at random. Therefore, it was the teacher's expectation of these kids that most influenced their subsequent achievement. In this case, their gains in IQ scores had more to do with how the teachers treated them based on their expectations. Teachers who expect amazing things from their kids are more likely to spend additional time with them, to be more patient with them, and to be a more affectionate, motivating, and encouraging. Another study set out to prove that even if the subject is unaware of their own beliefs about themselves and other people's expectations, they can still be affected by self-fulfilling prophecies. In this study, graduate students were given rats that were bred to be bright versus dumb. In fact, the rats were actually the same, but the bright rats outperformed the dumb rats at the end of the semester. In this case, the same phenomena occurred. The students who were assigned the bright rats spent more time with their rats, were patient with them as they struggled to figure out the maze, they were less likely to give up on them and just to go to the bar and have a beer. Again, it wasn't that the bright rats did better because they were actually smarter. It was a reflection of the researchers' expectations of those rats. Both of those research studies are great examples of how external expectations can lead to self-fulfilling prophecies. Another example of self-fulfilling prophecies relates to math anxiety. What often occurs with students who are very anxious about their ability to do well in a math class is that these students, believing that they won't do well anyway, actually attend class less often, engage with the instructor less often, do less math homework, practice less, and give up more easily. Therefore, when they end up not doing well in math, they are likely to see it as a reflection of their inability rather than recognize that they behaved in ways that made this more likely to occur. Another example occurs with making friends. We discuss this to some extent with stereotype threats, but another example would be the belief that no one likes me. What do we do in response to the belief that no one likes me? We avoid other people. From there, we are seen as uninterested, as though we're the one who doesn't want to be friends. Other people are likely to avoid us at that point because we look like we don't like them. That then confirms our belief that no one likes us, and from there we continue to avoid. You can see how this vicious cycle is a prime example of a self-fulfilling prophecy, and the way out is to behave differently. Double-blind procedures are used in research studies to minimize the effects of self-fulfilling prophecies. Double-blind means that both the participants and the researcher are unaware of the treatment condition. That way, the experimenter can't inadvertently influence the participants, and the participants will not differ based on their beliefs or expectations. This is why we use placebos in research studies. Otherwise, the individuals who take the pill would believe that they might feel better, and there'd be nothing to counterbalance that in the placebo group if they didn't also take a pill. The fact that everyone in the study swallows a pill and are unaware if that pill is active or not helps to reduce the effects of expectancies. It's also important that the researcher is unaware, because otherwise they might make comments such as, oh wow, you feel better? Or, Oh, you don't feel better? And just by doing something like that, the participant knows that they should or should not feel better, and they might feel differently because of it. The last thing we'll discuss in this lecture presentation are questions for evaluating research. First, 
we always want to ask, what was the nature of the sample? What was the sample size? What was the sampling process? Was there random assignment? Next, are the variables operationally defined? Do we feel clear as the reader as to what the researcher was investigating? Were the measurements used sensitive, valid, and reliable? Did they control for extraneous variables, or are there any other possible explanations for the relationship that was inferred? Do conclusions logically follow from observations? Is there any instance where correlation is used to support causation? Did they consider disconfirming evidence? And lastly, how might the experimenter's expectancies lead to biased results?